afternoon, everybody, at the uh, Director's Hour and a warm welcome from myself on behalf of the Fluid Rock and the Stellenbosch Graduate Institute team. I'm fortunate to have Prof. Frick Lantman, the CEO of SGI, and our own CEO, Renelle Klein, with me in the room today as well. And uh, looking forward to talking on a topic which, to some extent, may be you know, we we may be starting to feel that uh, we are, um, you know, overly discussing and, and it's maybe time to move on from some extent. But, you know, I think the one thing we would all agree on is that COVID-19 and the impact thereof on our lives at, at all levels should definitely not be underestimated. Um, a person, well-known person in governance circles like Klaus Schwab, World Economic Forum in his recent book called it the Great Reset. And so very definitely, you know, life is not going to be the same as we knew it. And so I do think that it is important that we take time out to really reflect and do a bit of also maybe post-mortem is premature to use, but that we look at the lessons to learn and, you know, what the good is that we can take from this. In a, in a recent publication by board intelligence, the authors made the point that from a board perspective, there has been, in their view, there have been more gains than losses. So that in itself is already a good and a positive starting point. Now, not too long ago, the Governance Institute of Australia and the Australian Institute of Company Directors published a very uh, informative and value adding document called governance through a crisis also talking about the lessons that we can can learn we are very fortunate and blessed to to have in the room with us uh catherine maxwell all the way from sydney and and the fact that you know it's 8 30 in the evening in sydney um catherine makes it even more special for us and and really appreciative that you're willing to talk to us today. Catherine is a lawyer herself, so Frick, you've got three legal eagles <laughs> on the panel with you, but you were a strong baby, I'm told, so I'm quite sure you'll be able to manage that. Catherine is, has a very strong background in, in governance and policy matters. She has, in, in her career, spent considerable time in many strong institutions in Australia, the, the Prudential uh, Regulation Authority, also the Stock Exchange, the Corporate Governance Council, with the, the Institute of Directors and also with the Financial Services Council. So I think, um, Catherine, you have worn very different hats as corporate lawyer and company secretary and governance professional as well. And uh, we're really looking forward to hearing from you a little bit about, you know, the, the key takeaways that, that you found as part of the study that you done that you did and then Renell and I also going to afterwards with Frick's input talk a little bit with you on how that relates to the South African environment so without any further ado Catherine the floor is yours and thank you once again uh, for, for speaking to us today that's okay it's nice to it's nice to speak to some people from the southern from another part of the southern hemisphere today so um, at least it's kind of end of the winter where you are. So thank you very much. I mean, that's a very, that's a great introduction. What I'll do is I've done a few slides and I will keep an eye on the time as well. I'll just start to share my screen. Here we go. Um, okay. So uh, last year with the Institute of Company Directors, we got together and we did um, a research project of and we called it learning from governance through a crisis. So, so what we did was did um, the company directors did a survey and then some in-depth interviews and, and we conducted some roundtables. And we just talked to people about how, how what their experience was um, from by then about four or five months of COVID-19. So it started in sort of March in um, Australia. And I think we did this work in kind of July, August. So we talked to them about a whole range of things, and I thought what I'd do is, is take you through the, some of the things that we learnt as a result of that, that research project, but also give you a little bit of context just about where we are in Australia at the moment. So we kind of got to the end of 2020, 
and I think things were beginning to open up um, and things were progressing. And I remember thinking to myself a few months ago, I was thinking, oh, okay, right, so things are, you know, getting back to normal. Unfortunately, um, sort of May or in June, the Delta strain emerged in Australia. So um, certainly in Sydney and in Melbourne, we're now locked down. I think I've been at home now for about, okay, in fact, I'm not counting the weeks um, because if I think about it, it bothers me, but if I don't think about it, it's fine. Um, And, you know, I'm very conscious that I'm in a pretty fortunate position. I've got a reasonable amount of room. The main irritants are my husband and um, grown-up sons. Um, you know, things could be worse. I could be homeschooling. There's a, you know, there are a lot worse things that could be happening to me. And also in terms of overseas, I think, you know, we have not had the massive case numbers that you have seen in, in South Africa or in Europe or in, a, in other parts of the Asia-Pacific Pacific region. So I think, you know, we've been relatively fortunate. Um, certainly our state governments and our, our government are quite concerned at the moment. And we've got some for Australia quite high levels. And they've finally kind of started to get getting around to getting the um, vaccination program kicked along in Australia. But so we're kind of in the second wave, really. Um, and I've spent a lot of time in, in the last year sort of helping my members who are company secretaries, um, some directors and risk people um, get through trying to run large and small companies um, in a virtual world when there are a lot of things that you can't do. So what I thought, let's just move that slide. Okay, so how did companies respond? We did a risk management survey um, kind of about April last year. It's something we do annually. And we found that 39% of respondents didn't run risk event scenarios. So that was one of the findings that really a number of organisations were not prepared. The organisations that tended to be better prepared um, were often those regulated by our prudential regulator because they are required to have um, a risk management framework in place. In terms of boards, boards went online overnight. And I think that would be the same experience for you people. But we were watching, I had a birthday, I think at the beginning of March, 2020, um, and I had some people over on the 13th of March, and I think that's probably the last party I went to. So that's, you know, getting on for 18 months ago. But literally, I think by the Friday, the following Friday, our office, we were all sent home. So immediately, um, you know, virtual meetings, meetings became shorter, much more regular because things were evolving really rapidly. Um, lifting and shifting, um, and if I had if I had meetings with my members, I'd sort of say, "How are you?" and they'd go minutes, um, because people were having lots and lots of meetings. Um, board papers that changed. Um, certainly, my experience as a company secretary is that there was always one person who wanted to have their board papers couriered in hard copy to their home address because that's how they liked it. I had a couple of those on most of the boards I looked after. So I think if nothing else, um, 2020 saw the death of the hard copy board board pack um, in most sectors because you just couldn't do it. Um, so I would imagine your experience was the same. So that's been a good thing, at least for, at least for trees. Um, we might get to notices of annual general meetings in a second and I'll talk to you a bit about our experience. Um, but certainly board papers, um, virtu- hard copy board papers virtually disappeared. Um, most companies form a crisis um, management teams and companies were having to look at a way to hold their annual general meeting. I was having a discussion um, with Renelle and Anna-Marie and the bulk of Australian companies, their financial year end is the 30th of June. So. Um, they're required to hold their annual general meeting within five months of the end of their financial year. So the um, the main AGM season in Australia is kind of, particularly for listed companies, um, is October, November. So a lot of them didn't have capacity in their constitutions to hold a virtual or a hybrid AGM. But everyone was terribly worried about any sort of gathering. And in fact, in lots of parts of the country, you couldn't have a gathering. 
So I've spent about 18 months um, working on um, trying to lobby and advocate for virtual and hybrid AGMs to be part of our, our regulatory landscape. And that's um, that's been a huge amount of work. I think I might have written, I know I've got one more coming before the end of the year. I think I've written about five submissions on hybrid and virtual AGMs um, since about March last year. So annual reporting was deferred. The um, regulator enabled companies to, to report later because it was difficult to get Apart from anything else, um, audit firms couldn't get in to do the, the audit uh, because of lockdowns. Certainly remuneration was a big focus, um, expenditure was really under scrutiny and, and last year pretty much you could say that variable pay was off the table, people were just not paying. I mean some bonuses were paid um, but by and large variable pay was, was off the table. One issue that we had was that the um, federal government um, had a thing called JobKeeper, so it was making payments to enable people to keep people on staff, um, to keep their jobs, and there were companies who accepted um, JobKeeper from the Commonwealth Government, and but nonetheless for, um, ended up having quite good results. And so it's been a bit of a focus for some of the shareholder groups um, companies that have not paid back JobKeeper or that accepted JobKeeper and then sort of paid dividends or bonuses. So that's been been an issue um, in the last sort of six to 12 months. And certainly a lot of the, the discussion and, and the commentary, there was a big focus on well-being, employee well-being um, and sharing the pain. I think that was a phrase that we heard um, quite a bit last year. And certainly at that stage, if I think about this time last year, um, the end was looking quite a quite a long way away, and at the moment, I think it's feeling like that again. As as we get to sort of you know August and it's nearly September, I have no idea. Well, I, I kind of do, but it's it's extraordinary how fast this period has gone. Notwithstanding, none of us have been doing terribly much, or certainly nothing terribly interesting. Okay, so what were the things that we found? Well, I think we found that if you have adaptation and agility were absolutely key. Um, so people had to adapt to the virtual boardroom and there really is a new etiquette for engagement online. It's not necessarily easy and you have to actually practice a bit to get it right. So I think that's one of the things. Um, the chair is absolutely vital and the chairs had to develop new skills, managing a meeting, um, making sure that people contributed you don't aren't able to rely on the sort of physical cues that people give you um, when you're all in a group. Um, so, you know, someone who learnt or developed the ability to chair an online meeting well became incredibly important. Although, interestingly, I, I run four policy committees um, and we've done that for years and one of them, we typically have about 40 attendees and for years we've done it by telephone conference. Well, we've moved to Zoom and in fact, whilst a lot of people are sort of bemoaning being online, none that we're finding with that particular meeting that because we've moved from telephone to Zoom, people have really enjoyed seeing each other. It's like, oh my goodness, I've been talking to you for some years and that's what you look like. And I've actually found in that particular group, the level of engagement has actually increased and I'm, I'm sort of getting a lot more, a lot more people attending, I think, because they're really keen to see each other. But I think for boards and committees, I think they really have felt that physical absence and found it much more difficult. Time zones have been a problem, particularly if you've got a global board. I think that's been a real issue. One of my members was saying they were sort of, they used to do two full days. So then the, what they've, you know, they would then split them out over three and, you know, they were sort of sharing the pain depending on the time zone. So, you know, one, one end of the time zone, Europe would take it in turns to start at, they'd take it in turns to start at 5 a.m. or at 5 p.m. just to try and get through the meeting. So that was a, re a real challenge. And people get tired on Zoom. Um, I think that's the other thing. I think everyone's found it's surprising how tired you get sitting staring at a screen. As a complete aside, nonetheless, we are all expecting our children. Um, if you're homeschooling, all these poor kids are online all day. So we'll, um, a bit schizophrenic in terms of, of that attitude. Um, 
the stability and security of platforms was a real issue, particularly last year. I don't, I think things have got better and certainly a lot of the providers have really stepped up. You keep getting new features in Zoom and in Teams. So I think we're seeing um, the software providers have really done a lot of work um, to improve the features and the security. But certainly initially, um, things were a bit tricky. And I don't know if South African directors or certainly senior South African directors are similar to senior Australian directors, but a lot of them were not particularly tech savvy. And, and my big some of my big listed company so secretary members, they also kind of became a discrete head of IT and they'd have to sort of do discrete one-on-one -on -one technology familiarisation um, sessions with some of their, their board members and sort of teach them how to plug themselves into the modem so that they didn't keep dropping out. So certainly for company secretaries, they've been very busy doing a whole range of things that are not necessary within their, in their job descriptions. But there were some benefits, I think. I mean, there were challenges, but there were benefits. It was much more easy to get a meeting with directors. You know, they weren't on planes all the time. They weren't travelling massively so that you could actually get hold of them um, to, to get things done at, you know, reasonably short notice, which was a real benefit, particularly when things were moving rapidly. So people were more accessible. And I think people also realised that you could have shorter meetings. And I think a lot of companies are now thinking about the cadence of their meetings. You know, do we need to have these long meetings um, or quite as many of them? So I think that's that's a change that's going to happen. And I mean, obviously we're in sort of stage, we're in sort of wave two. So things are still in a bit of a state of flux, but I wouldn't be surprised to see that a number of companies, even big ones, move to a different kind of, you know, one in two meetings are physical. You know, can you, given that we've all operated like this for the best part of two years, can you still justify the expense and time of flying people all over the country? Um, not to mention, I think the other thing is that, you know, people had to make decisions in a really agile way. Um, and there was obviously um, had to be good board and management relations. I think communication was really important and lots of people found that the chair and CEO were talking quite a lot. And certainly one member said to me that they, their chair really took it upon themselves. They had meetings every day right at the height of things. So they had a sort of every day, daily meeting with all the senior executive team. And then the chair took it upon themselves to, to communicate that to the board rather than having to go the sort of the CEO to go around to each of the directors, the chair acted as the communication point, which meant that the CEO could actually get on with the day and get on with, um, you know, trying to get to get thing, keep things going. Some directors said that they found it a bit more difficult to get access to management. Um, and certainly, you know, company secretaries, most of my members reported being incredibly busy. Um, sorting out technology, making sure everyone was getting informed. Um, one of the challenges they had was that typically your board papers go out a week before. Um, by the time you got to the meeting, a lot of that information was out of date. So it was trying to make sure that directors had, you know, up to date information. So the packs would go out, but there'd be a short paper um, the day before with the latest information. So that was a real challenge. Lots of regulatory development, so, so staying on top of all of that. Um, planning, you know, particularly for the large companies, the board calendar is set a couple of years in advance. So having to sort of pick that all up and reconfigure it. Um, so lots of logistical challenges. And then just doing, and, I, and again, lots and lots of minutes. Um, you know, if you're having lots of minute meetings, you need lots of minutes. And of course, one of the challenges if if you weren't having large board packs, you actually had to make sure that things were well minuted. Um, so that was, you know, you know, they didn't just have to be lots of them. Um, not that my members would do bad minutes, but they would have to be quite considered. And I, I always thought I was a bit of a slow minute taker until one of my very senior members said to me, no, 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 I've got to block out a couple of days. And they reckon that it takes them two or three times as long as the meeting to actually minute it. And I thought, okay, well, I'm not that slow. So that was, that actually made me feel a bit better. 
Um, but yeah, so you know that's that's quite a big task, and it's not something that you can actually delegate to just anybody to get it right, particularly for a large company. Um, takes a lot of time and a lot of skill. In fact, if we ever do anything on minutes, uh, it's usually a sellout with our members. Um, you know, because it's and I, I gather the same across the world. Anything you do on minutes and around company secretaries, they're always interested. Uh, right, let's just move to the next slide. I think the other thing that really emerged that you had to have the right scaffolding in place. It's really critical. No point trying to make it up on the spot. You actually had to have um, plans in place. And those companies that did better had existing crisis management and business continuity plans. And as I said, quite often they were in the financial services sector because they're required to under the prudential standards. So they were the companies that tended to find things were a bit better and a bit easier for them. Um, risk management, I think also that people really, the people that struggled also really didn't have a proper risk management framework. So and the importance of good risk management framework and having the right structures in place, that really was important. Um, the other thing was, and one of the members said this to me, that they felt boards in general don't look at strategic risk particularly well or particularly often unless they're being pushed into it, say by a regulator, and they felt that was something that boards need to really start thinking thinking about, even, um, you know, it doesn't often get, in their experience, it didn't get talked about even at sort of the annual strategy day, and I thought, oh, that's, that's actually quite an interesting comment. Um, so... However, um, particularly in the sort of not-for-profit sector, but not necessarily confined to the not-for-profit sector, technology for a lot of companies gave them the ability to engage with a whole lot of stakeholders that they wouldn't normally be able to reach. Um, I think if you read the report governing through a crisis, um, one company reports that they were able to have a meeting with about 300 people present, which went really well. I think it was one of the AIDS charities or one of the AIDS groups, and they said they had this 300 stakeholder meeting, which was not something they could typically do, and they found some real benefits from it. And certainly I've talked to um, people, sort of membership groups, where they found technology enabled them to, all their members to come to meetings and be part of things, where normally, you know, due to cost, they might not travel in for the annual meeting but this way they were able to do it. And certainly some of the larger listed companies have actually been reporting increased numbers of attendees. Um, I was talking to Renelle and Anne-Marie yesterday and saying, was it yesterday? I actually can't remember, I've lost track. Um, but one of the big issues in Australia has been um, some of the investor groups are very much opposed to virtual meetings and they were saying to me that virtual meetings are actually not considered a problem in South Africa. And certainly I've spent a lot of time sort of battling to try and get them through in the legislation in the, in the last 18 months. So, but companies um, for this AGM season, they're gonna be forced to do it again because it, you know, everyone's in lockdown. And then just to finish off, I thought I might do um, women on boards in Australia. I don't know whether you have an equivalent in South Africa, but I would imagine you might. They did a, a SNAP survey about 10 days ago and the results came out last week. So I just thought I would talk to you about um, what the results of that survey said. So it's a second COVID year. They're coping just, um, the people who responded to their survey. So six and a half out of 10. Um, so they're managing, but you know things are wearing a bit thin. In terms of the main issues that they report, so you know eight, almost 80% lack of face-to-face -face meetings. That's really bothering people. Um, zoomed out, um, and I'm sure I'm sure that's a phrase in South. Something or an equivalent, I'm sure, is current in South Africa. Everyone's a bit over Zoom. Although, my, as I said, my members who used to meet by telephone likes like Zoom. So, um, lower staff morale certainly, and they report feeling professionally lonely. And I think that's probably true too. I certainly, um, and. One good thing, if you've got any sort of exercise regime and you eat properly, that does seem to have correlated with a higher coping rating. So if you're doing those things, keep doing them because it means you're going to cope better. And I do say that, you know, 
I took up rowing about 10 years ago. I don't quite know why I did, but I have said on a number of occasions, it's the girls from my rowing club um, and we do lots of exercise on, on Zoom and chat to each other. They have stopped me murdering my husband and son. So, you know, it's been a good thing. And I think, yeah, look, I think my personal experience is if you've got to, if you do some exercise, um, it does help. But I thought that was very interesting that it was re reported in that survey. And then just I thought you'd, they had a few statistics and a few bit of feedback about boards, which I thought you might be interested in. So this is my last slide. Oh, no, my second last slide. So 72 of the respondents sit on a board, um, all female, women on boards, not surprising. Um, age between 45 and 65. Um, about half their time is spent on board, um, their boards or committees. This Women on Boards is a group that try and help women to get board positions, and about half of them said, you know what, they're just not feeling it at the moment. They're just not feeling, you know, they're not feeling as though they're sort of making progress on, on getting themselves to where they want to be. They're trying to keep their networks going, but I think they're finding it hard. And a quarter of them um, think that remote board meetings are having a somewhat negative impact on decision making in relationships. So just thought that was a bit of interesting feedback in a second COVID year um, when a lot of people, particularly um, most of the people in who responded to that survey were in the two states that are currently subject to lockdown. So that's kind of how people are feeling. And I just included um, so I just included a few quotes from there that I'm sure they'll distribute the slides. But I quite liked that one, hybrid working, and I meant to say this earlier, hybrid working will enable more diversity on boards if the old-fashioned chairs allow it. <laughs> and I think that's true. You know, if you if you are using technology, it is going to make people who might not be able to participate um, able to participate. So I think that's definitely something that um, is worth thinking about. And then I thought we'd just finish with I don't have the answers here, but I just highlighted a few things that, you know, we probably need to think about for the future. So board skills and composition, you know, do you have the right people on the board? Is your composition what you need? I don't know about South Africa, but um, most boards are hysterical about cyber security at the moment. Um, and certainly doing everything online in the last 18 months has been you know, most companies have been subject to some sort of cyber attack. And if you talk to some of the companies, you know, it's, it's just daily. There are not a lot of Australian directors with with the sort of skills you need um, to be on top of all of that. So I think that, you know, have you got the right skills for what you need, um, particularly as things are changing? What are the board agendas like? You know, is what we've always done the way we should do it in the future? Are we reporting adequately? Does inflammation flow well? Certainly one company was talking to us recently about the fact that they've really just, a lot of things are now done by circular resolution, routine things, and board, board time is taken up with the really sort of big ticket items. Strategy. How are you going to do strategy in the future? Um, will you do it sort of, you know, the usual strategy day? Risk management, workforce planning. I think that's another real issue. Um, and the workforce is changing. And it will be interesting to see what impact. Certainly, I think in terms of workforce, the impact, the toughest impact has been on younger people. Um, you know, particularly in insecure employment. So a lot of that is going to, you know, that's going to, how is all that going to come out in the wash? And then I suppose compliance obligations, you know, how are you keeping on top of your compliance obligations and how are you monitoring things? And that's more difficult remotely. You know, how are your systems standing up? So that's probably enough from me, but look, you know, love to have a chat with Renelle and Anna-Marie about anything that they'd like to, um, tease out from from that and I'll see what I can do about stopping sharing my screen. Thanks. Thanks for that, Catherine. Thanks for that insight. It's really interesting and I think quite a number of things that resonates with us. Um, you could probably see my head going like this <laughs> on a number of, of occasions, you know. Um, I I absolutely believe, you know, and, and Renal must come on here as well to chat with us, but I, I really passionately, strongly believe that this is is a one crisis that we must really make the best of from a board 
functioning perspective and that you know it's a really a transformational opportunity the question is whether boards are going to are we ready really to to take that and i think your point on agility um comes out quite strongly because i think that's often a, um an underestimated sort of value in in the boardroom as well um the, for me the question and i would love to hear your view on this do you think this has made boards and maybe the answer is not that simple, but you can give, let me tell me what you think. Do you think this has made boards generally more or less effective? This whole new paradigm that we have. Hard to know, but I think they've started to ask themselves the question in a different, in a way that they might not have done traditionally. And I think they're starting to think about effectiveness in a different way because they've been forced to learn a whole lot of new things really fast and do a whole lot of things that they haven't done before. Um, so I think they are starting to think about, and certainly the fact that they're even thinking about, um, you know, the member who was talking about how they're doing their whole agendas differently, you know, one of our large, one of our large banks. So, you know, a la very large, traditional organisation is now going, well, you know what, um, what, um, you know, how do our meetings work? You know, this could, we could do this better. And they're getting really good feedback. The company secretary said she's getting amazing feedback um, that, you know, things are working so much better. Yeah, we, I've, I was chatting to Renal the other day as well, and I made the point, you know, we do, as part of our services, we do board evaluations. And for the past 18 months, one of the, the the common threats that have come through these board evaluations is how well boards rate themselves on the way that they've managed, you know, through COVID. Um, and, and I found that quite interesting. And in fact, I, I sense a kind of a pride, you know, coming through that as well, that, that they've managed the way that they've done. I, I also gather a kind of a, a new sp uh, um, dynamic and, and a kind of a spirit amongst the board members. You know, it, it's as though that sense of purpose and meaning has come back. You know, we, we can act, we can make a difference, we can add value. It's no longer this, OK, four times a year we meet and we, you know, we look impressive and we say a few things and we have a nice lunch and, and we go home. You know, you, we really need it now. Um, and we we can make we can add value. So I, th I think that that is a great new dynamic that we should not lose going yeah. forward. And look, you know, particularly in the charitable not for profit sector, and you get a lot of you know senior company directors who give a lot of their time in that sector. You know, they've been doing some really tough stuff. You know, particularly you know aged care sector and social services. And I don't know if South Africa is the same, but a huge amount of social service is delivered by that sector on behalf of government. So they've been at the front of doing some really important stuff. So, um, you know, that that must give people a sense of purpose. No, absolutely. Frick, I saw on, on the chat there was a, a question that came through and, and I think you answered it. Catherine, they were asking what the acronym WHS stands for on your... Uh, work, work Health and Safety. Yeah, well, well done, Frick. Well, so Frick sort of guessed that. <laughs> what do you call it in yeah. South Africa? Yeah, health and health and safety. The W isn't there, and, and sometimes sometimes we will talk about she, um, meaning safety, health, and the environment. You know, so so that's sometimes okay. another acronym that we use. Frick. Anna Marie, there's a there's also a comment from Richard uh, based on what Catherine has said, and that is. There's much introspection that needs to take place currently amongst board members, and I I would imagine it's it, it covers a broad spectrum of of introspection and not just uh, the efficacy uh, or the efficiency of the, of the board meetings. You know the technology that you use because you discuss very serious stuff, and if you are in the middle of an argument or a conversation and technology starts interfering, you break the momentum, etc. So there's a there are a number of things to be considered in this new space and, and being able to handle it. Catherine, you've got to, you want to respond to that? 
Yeah, look, I think it's interesting. Um, I don't know because it's still playing out. Because I think psychologically we were all heading back to the world as we knew it. But actually we've had this kind of shock. So I don't know how that's going to play out. I think people have certainly, I mean, it's last year where people were, you know, there was lots of, there were lots of people baking sourdough, which is a very Sydney kind of thing to do. Um, much less of that this year. You know, people are tired, people are worn out, people are afraid. Um, and I think, yeah, I think people are tired. It was interesting. I was having a discussion with my husband last night and I was sort of talking about, you know, younger people, I suppose, between, say, 18 and 30 and, and just the impact that this has had on them and, you know, kids at school. And he said, well, this is kind of like the Second World War. It's that sort of experience if you if you talk to that generation. And I was thinking about it and I was sort of thinking about it this morning and I thought, well, yeah, and, you know, particularly if you were in Europe, that went on for years, like a number of years. So it's that kind of, you know, I think people are sort of, people are tired. And as I said, Australia hasn't had it too badly comparatively. Yeah, and if I listen to what Anna-Marie is, uh, is saying, uh, Catherine, uh, she said in the beginning uh, the kind of the reset button that has been pushed and you, your comment now about psychologically we're thinking we're going back to the old world, which I don't think is a reality. We, there's a new world awaiting this place. Mm. Mm. And I, I don't know think you we want... quite... Sorry, Catherine, continue. Now you can come in. Anna Marie, if, um, if I can come in, thanks for that, uh, Catherine. So, I mean, two of the things that I find uh, that we need to take forward in a very practical way is I am suggesting to boards that they write an annexure on the code of conduct on being on board meetings. So you get two types of people, right? You get people with camera on and camera off. Those are the two personality types of the digital work. And pretty much, you know, I'm a camera on person, so I take camera off as a signal to say, I'm not interested, I don't want to be here, I don't want to participate. I, I don't see it as a signal, you know, just being there and pretending to listen. Most You can see people are on their laptops and then they're checking email as well. But I mean, it, it's a better vibe. And also, um, I think that boards need to really to add it to their board charter, you know, to say how do we conduct ourselves online? And also um, about what you expect from um, from 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 the chair because you get introverts and extroverts. Introverts will politely wait until they ask for their opinion. Extroverts don't care. They think as they speak, you know. So that's the one thing I think we really need to take to companies to, regardless of the size of the board, is this is this code of conduct. And then you need to conduct yourself that way. I mean, we've got one director who who um, has his lunch with his um, his his camera on, right? And it's never a pretty picture. So um, I've also done it. How embarrassing, but uh, you know, it's 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 we don't want that, right? Um, and what do we do over lunchtime? Do we break? Do what do we do? So, so I think that code of conduct of what every company deems acceptable is is whatever they do, you know, this is the one thing. And then the next thing that I really found interesting from the report was it says crisis test relationships, strong foundations must be fostered before yes. not during a crisis. Now, talking about your five year war that we're in is the next thing is that right now we all know in let's say in your environment in your board that you have good or you know with who in your board you have better relationships and with who in your board you have you know maybe relationships that can be improved so i think in that regard it all comes down back to your stakeholder management and if you see stakeholder management as circles of influence let's let's just say i think now is the time for us during between our waves is to maybe say to people, let me meet you for a cup of coffee, let, let me check in with you face to face, especially the people that you're struggling with, right? Or that mm. your, your relationships maybe have not grown or, and and maybe that comes back to the people, the women that you interviewed to, to say, well, in between the waves, it's the time to have a different strategy. Because I believe people have something called hermatitis, which is my own name for when you become a hermit, <laughs> you know, then you don't want to leave your house. So I don't know what you think about that, those two things. I'm an extrovert, so I can talk under what I often say. I think my husband would love to be able to have put me on mute. But um, is that interesting? I would not. One of my members 
um, we sort of have documents that people donate that other members can use. And they have a protocol for Teams meetings that that particular company has adopted. And I must admit, I haven't heard of any directors having their cameras off in board meetings. And I've certainly seen people talk about, I can't remember where I read, where I read it, but I saw it online recently, you know, camera off is bad manners, eating is bad manners, unless you know the person well, um, or you ask permission or everybody's having lunch, or whether it's a sort of, you know, it's an occasion where it's a working lunch or something. But yeah, um, that's interesting. I'm surprised by that. But camera off, yeah, camera off means I'm not interested. Catherine, there, there is a there is a question in the uh, in the uh, ribbon here. It's an inevitable question. Please advise what impact any of the change in work environment has had on directors' fees. Not a lot. Might have gone up a little bit. We do an annual remuneration survey. I, not that I recall being remarked upon. So, yeah, as, might as have been a bit of an increase on audit committee on audit committees, but that was about it. I just to to come in here and, and just slightly take you back on on the and Renal's point about the cameras, of course, one of the the alleged uh, um, and, and not alleged make it sound like, you know, I was not I suspecting the, you know, the integrity or are questioning the integrity of the, the but the, the issue around connectivity. So you will often get people in the room, you know, in the meeting saying, sorry, I can't switch my camera on because I have a connectivity issue. Now, I've recently spent two months in the Netherlands and I've seen the quality of good connectivity versus what we do experience in South Africa. So, you know, we... We actually do have, because I absolutely also believe if we want to make best use of, of the virtual meeting environment, a camera should be on because that really makes, you know, for the dynamic, a more constructive, positive dynamic. But then you have this, you know, uh, um, hardware infrastructure challenge, yeah. we are set. So I think as South Africa, we need to make sure that we get our ducks in a row as far as our technology and, and our infrastructure is concerned as well. Australia's not too flash. Is it good in the Netherlands? Yes, no, it was very good. Absolutely, um, very strong. Australia's a bit, Australia's a bit patchy too. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, that's interesting. So, I have, heard, yeah, I've heard it's better. It's like, oh, I, I had no idea. Yeah. Frick, a question or a comment you want to make? Uh, not there is just somebody here that offers kind of what's happening on their side. They say we have everyone show their face at the start, and if we have connectivity issues, allow the camera off, especially for those experiencing issues. So it seems oh, yeah. like a very practical. That's, that's fine. I think that's right. And I mean, if someone if someone starts crackling and they say, "Look, it, it'll be better if I turn the camera off," no one minds. But people who just do not put their camera on, it's very strange. I do find it a bit with government meetings. If you're having like a big meeting with government and there are sort of more junior staff members, you'll often find that you just get the little the little disc on the side. But yeah, I find it disconcerting if you can't see people. Renelle? Yes, I also want to pick up on something, another thing in the in the report is um, that board sh should accept ambiguity and lessen rather than add to management workloads. Now, I don't think that's just a Corona COVID uh, riot. <laughs> and we always take that forward. Now, what we do quite a lot of work with um, Exco reporting into boards and helping Exco's to devise their dashboards and their reporting and really making it much shorter, but much more, I would say, impactful. And we've seen a lot of companies actually reporting on, for example, their finances in detail every second uh, meeting, meeting, not the AFS or the budget meeting. So. So I think what happens there is I think the executives must take a lot of the the blame for this because when an, a non-executor in a board meeting sometimes asks for information in addition, they don't necessarily know that the information that they're asking for is not available or will take a massive amount of um, manpower to produce this or that report. So my view is that executives should in the meeting say, you know, Check. Is it is it aligned to strategy, whatever you're wanting? Is it too operational? 
you know, because some people don't really understand the word non-executive director, you know, become very executive. Or is it something that that they really should be producing? You know, that assessment should be made. And then I think executives must understand that have the right to push back, not in a negative or disrespectful way, but to help them understand that what they're asking for is either not in line with strategy, will take a lot of effort, and that opportunity cost of people, because time is a is a finite resource. You know, it's a resource we don't report on. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that particular query will require us to reconfigure and run a whole new report in the finance system that we'll have to get some coding done for. Yeah, that's right. Um, and, you know, and that's quite common. Um, and you do, having worked in a lot of sectors and with a lot of with a lot of management teams, you do hear it over and over and you hear, I just wish the board would stay out of management and get into strategy. Yeah, I, I think there's a, there's always there's that kind of healthy tension between that because I mean if you really when you talk to to you know or when we do to the training with board members as well you know just your key role is to steer and supervise steer and supervise steer and supervise you know stay out of the engine room stay on the bridge of the ship but make sure there's proper and we've lost uh, we've lost her for a second but um, okay through you back we thought we'd lost you. Um, make sure that there's proper communication between the bridge and the engine room and I think if there's one thing that we could that we should really not lose um, from all of this that we've gone through in the functioning of boards is the way we do we communicate and I absolutely believe there's room for shorter more more regular meetings you know and not these sort of quarterly long with with five six hundred papers, you know, pages of, of board packs. I think we need to look at ways in which executives, to, to Renal's point and management as well, communicate on a more continuous basis, but on those things that should be on the dashboard of the board. So to avoid that potential risk of them stepping, overstepping the boundary, but also that there's in between meetings, you know, on key significant kind of strategic matters, there's a, a short update coming from, for example, the CEO's office, so that the time when we get together in the room again, we are already all on the same page as to what has happened since the previous discussion, and we can give our input and we can move forward. So I really believe, you know, we there's part of, of the, the introspection that we need to do and the, and, and the opportunity we must take here as each and every board is to have this conversation, not assume that we're all on the same page, but have a conversation about what's working, what's not working, you know, for for moving if you know, as we move forward as well. So that you know, in in at the end of the day, we may end up with a kind of a hybrid of in you know in person meetings again. I read a, a statement which I thought was quite valid as well to say, you can't you can't build a culture in a virtual environment. You need that human touch and human engagement interaction. You can just, you can maintain a culture. But as new people come in, et cetera, you know, to make them part of your culture and your values, you need to, you need a different kind of approach than just sitting online all day. So I do I think there is absolute space for both these kinds of scenarios, but how we make the best use of it, I think the responsibility will be with us and with each board. I was I, I was one hmm. sorry, Anna Maria, I was wondering. Uh, Based on what you are saying in this in this uh, introspection and what Catherine has said previously uh, from the report that the, the chairs are now speaking more frequently with the CEO and uh, and act as the as the communication portal to the rest of the board. So I'm wondering is if that behavior is going to be restricted to the crisis or are people going to use that uh, almost as an as an idea going forward because it's 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 partly good for the chair and the ceo to speak more regularly but there's also a shadow side to that uh, threatening the boundaries of non-executives yep no absolutely i mean and i guess it's getting the balance right um and i think certainly last year there was a real sense in which a lot of directors were like, we need to know this information and then we've got to get out, of, get out of your way. Let you get on with it. You know, let you supply toilet paper or, you know, um, for example, in terms, 
There was a toilet paper shortage in Australia. That was one of the big dramas that we, we went through. I don't know whether you had that in South Africa, but toilet paper for some reason. <laughs> yeah, so, we know. know. <laughs> okay, so it was the same there as well. But, yeah, you know, um, one of the – there are sort of two major chains of growth who supply supermarkets – you know, let that poor man go and get the trucks rolling with toilet paper, you know, stop asking him ridiculous questions. <laughs> yeah, no, I think for, I also had that and uh, made a note when Catherine spoke about, I think one of the other things that we need to also take further from here is that potential change in the role of the chair, you know, yeah. uh, um, you know, and, and I think it's there's some valuable lessons to be learned for chairs. From yeah. from this as well. Also, the discipline that they bring in um, to to Renal's point around you know the 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 protocols, you know, and and the way I think uh, the chair chair plays an extremely important um, you know part of making sure that the best use you know the best we make the best use of the virtual the platforms and the virtual meetings. I think and I sort of just learning the skill of getting around everybody and getting everyone to participate. And that takes some doing. It's, it's not yes. necessary. That, I mean, some people will be better at it than others, but you can learn stuff. Um, and certainly I did a bit of teaching last year and you actually did have, to, and facilitating online, you actually do have to kind of make a conscious effort of going around and, and trying to build for and, and, and keep the discussion going. And so I think they have had to expand. You know, they've got to be, a good chair is a good manager of people. And so, you know, this is just an added dimension and a different kind of manifestation of that, but learning a different skill. There's a, and it's there's, a, there's a comment here made by Jeff in the in the communication ribbon saying a director is responsibility three, six, five days a year, and therefore the risk regular updates of relevant information is important. So I guess oh, yeah. it's confirming what's happening. But I think it's it's finding a way to do it um, that's not the traditional 650-page board pack. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the key. I think that's the key. We, we've got to really think out of the box in new ways and how we communicate and how we keep board members, uh, um, you know, also informed as to, to, the, to the developments that's going on. And and I think as board members, they said the, the part about introspection or reflection that, that Richard made as well, I think board members should also be asking them, themselves and really look themselves in the mirror as to to what extent have they showed up and have added real value, you know, or have they been more of a break to, to management and the CEO, you know, when there was a need for fast, quick decision making. Renelle, please, please use this platform and opportunity to share your beautiful, insightful uh, formula so the directors can go away here and know how to to evaluate their value add. Okay, <laughs> thanks Anna Marie. So uh, we have a formula of being a director, but you can apply it if to check if you're a good, um, uh, you know, employee, uh, wife, husband, you know, whatever. So it's 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 about the value that you add. Then you detract so, the minus the distractions. It's you have the contribution you make. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, is your contribution your value add then you minus your distraction and the disruptions you cause and that equals a net effect now some people's net effect on a board is positive and some people's net effect on a board is negative which means you're actually dis detracting from that board um, and if you add all the board members together you get the net effect of of the board itself and we have found that in some cases you know if the board wasn't there the company would have done much better and um, we're saying this a little bit tongue in the cheek, but and I um, I always joke um, about, you know, you really can apply it to your spouse as well, you know, to see how they've been doing for, for the month, for example. <laughs> but yeah, we thank you. We're starting, Catherine, we're going to start wrapping up as well. I think um, I'm going to ask you for some closing remarks and then Frick can wrap up for us. But from my perspective, I think if I can leave a few last uh, um, comments that, you know, it, this is really my my encouragement and my plea will be with people on the call as well and those in positions of leadership and influences. Don't waste this opportunity to really, to, uh, you know, to over 
to turn over every little rock and thing in your in your practices, in your functioning, you know, and, and take the good from this because they definitely are a number of gains so that we do come up with. I mean, you know, what is concerning to me and, and Catherine, I think there we found the same in South Africa, your point about the lack of proper risk management, you know, oversight. Um, which is actually astonishing if you if you think of what we have gone through already. It really it really is a is a, a one of the crosses against sports. You know, if at this point in time they are still found with their pants, you know, around the the ankles when when the crisis hits. So there are some. I think we we've got a few things that we can't be too proud of, and we really should use this opportunity to come out of here more agile, stronger, more effective to make the contribution to that Renell is talking about that positive contribution as an individual and as a team. But thanks. I'd love to hear from from a few closing remarks from your side. Oh, look, I think that's absolutely right. I think I've certainly thought more about and the people I've come across have thought more about, you know, is the way we've always done this the right way to do it? And is there a better way to do it? Um, I think we're a bit kind of wobbly because I think we're in the second wave. I think that's knocked people a bit sideways. Um, and so it's kind of how do we move forward from this? But I, I think, yeah, don't waste the opportunity to rethink some of the things you do because there are better ways of doing things. Um, and it's been it's been fascinating to talk to people who are kind of parallel to me rather than <laughs> up above me. So it's kind of, you know, it's kind of similar but different. And it's actually been you know it's been a really interesting to to, to learn more about you know how you do things. Thank you. Thanks from my side, That's Renal. I don't know whether you've got one or two remarks and then Frick, I'll leave it to you to also thank Catherine and just wrap it up for us. No, thank you very much, Catherine, for joining us. And and I don't, you know, enjoy it when other people suffer, but it does give us insight into how things are in Australia and the similarities and that pretty much we're all in the same boat, you know, and that brings you very much back to the ESG discussion again. Um, but good luck over there. And, and uh, please share your future learnings and surveys with us. We'd love to learn. Pleasure. Will do. I'll keep you on the list. Thank you. Catherine, my, my, my colleagues and co-hosts, uh, they have done the, the thank yous, uh, but also thank you from my side. As, as you speak, uh, I was reminded of that, and you, you've alluded to it somehow now, don't let a good crisis go to waste. So I think there's a lot to be learned in, in this space. Uh, what I've listened for and what I've heard is, and, and I've watched Anna-Marie and uh, Runel in their responses, there's a lot that resonates with us uh, and, and on your side. And it was very much confirmed when you referred to the toilet paper. So there's a lot of uh, resonance uh, in, the, in the environment. But I think the, the point you made and which Richard made is that uh, it is really a time to to do introspection and a lot of reflection, especially that slide of yours where, where you indicated what we need to think about now is the board and the board skills in a, diff in a different world or in a reset world and the, com the composition. Uh, and, uh, and the risk management is accentuated in this space. Uh, those, that, that, I think you referred to 39% who did not uh, do it. So those 39%, if one tests it again, now it should be zero uh, if given the, uh, the circumstances where we're in. And I think then the workforce planning, especially the slide that you referred to, the survey that you've done under women, the, 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 the sense of loneliness, the, the, the fatigue, uh, people trying to, to adopt. Uh, and I said to a colleague of mine the other day, all of these noises that we are hearing is because the paradigm has shifted and we don't know the rules of the new game. And this is the noise we make is trying to find out what are the rules of the new game. And uh, I think you've given us some comfort that we are not alone in this, but you've also strengthened the idea of we have to reflect and learn from each other. And thank you so much for that. It's my pleasure. I Have just a nice want to, weekend, the day after tomorrow. I just want to leave our thank our, our audience for their attendance. Uh, 
I see some of them have, have left us. Uh, that's to their own detriment. Uh, and uh, I want to kind of indicate that a possible subject in our next session would be around vac the vaccination policy. Uh, and how does one handle that? I've seen from the legal environment, there's some cautionary notes coming, uh, stay away from a mandatory kind of policy and there's conversation and em em employment and, and labor has to find one, have to find one another. So uh, it, we think that is a valuable uh, subject to talk about and we will keep you informed uh, when we are going to address that and with whom. But thank you to you all. Thank you, Life thank you, Frick. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. It's great to have a new Australian friend and we hope to speak to you again. Thank you, everybody that joined us today for a good session. We look forward to hosting you in, in September. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Good night. Bye-bye.